يا ربي صل على النبي على آل آل رسول الله خير الأنام وآله يا ربي صل على النبي الغالي الغالي رسول الله خير الأنام وآله يا ربي صل على النبي بالله رب العالمين الحمد لله وكي نعمه يكافي ومزيده يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحسي فنا أنا عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملل على إلى يوم الدين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى يترك الأرض ومن عليها وأنت خير الوارثين نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير نفع انتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحفع على التمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء للهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وشلاء ومرضاته وخربه وفوابه سبحانه وتعالى إن شاء الله our discourse is the discourse of Medina al Munawwara, the enlightened city of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. It's a tale of two cities, the reality of Mecca and the reality of Medina al Munawwara. Not a tale in the negative sense, but these are real stories. And Allah subhanahu wa taala, He possesses ahsan al qasas. Allah jalla fil ula, He has the greatest of stories of the greatest of narratives, and there's no. Narrative that is greater than the narrative of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. I mean, from one perspective, the narrative of the entire universe relates to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why many of the Imams of Sirah, when they begin the narrative of prophecy, i.e. Sirah, they begin at the very beginning of creation. And the great Imam al-Shami rahimahullah ta'ala is of those who adopts that, his approach to what? Uh, the great narrative, the narrative of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But ultimately, as we engage I, the message that the Prophet ﷺ was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it relates to what these two narratives, I, the narrative of Mecca and the narrative of Medina. And they are radically different. They're radically different in terms of the space. And they're radically different in terms of the spirit also, the spirit of both places. And we've looked at Mecca. Mecca is a place of Iman. Mecca is a place of Akhlaq. Mecca is a case is a place where believers in the real sense are what are crafted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Jalla fil Ula always crafts that which is beautiful under the war, under the fairness of difficulty. And no doubt whatsoever those who are who traverse the prophetic path in the one the difficult environment of Mecca. Mecca as a place in and of itself is a difficult environment. Never mind the environment in which the Prophet Sallallahu was subjected to at the beginning of prophecy. It was difficult, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through difficulty, brought forth great believers. And we look at all of those who the tongue of prophecy informed us that they are guaranteed paradise. Every single one of them, these were believers who were crafted in quote unquote the fairness of difficulty inside of Mecca. But Medina is going to present its own challenges, and Medina is going to be no doubt a blessed place. If you understand that Mecca is blessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Mecca. Especially by virtue of a mighty prophet, the great prophet Sayyid Ibrahim alayhi salam. Prophet Ibrahim is the one who brings Mecca out of the sands of Arabia. Okay? Mecca was something that was understood as a sacred place. The Kaaba was sacred, but the Kaaba had been buried, buried beneath the sands of Arabia. Until the great prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam arrives and he is the one who's going to bring it with his son Ismail, resurrect what the sanctity of Mecca. And prior to that, the sanctity of Arabia was on the opposite side of the peninsula, in Bahrain. And in Bahrain was the, world, the great place of sanctity inside of Arabia. Why? We understood Mecca, but nobody knew where Mecca was. Okay, Bahrain, the great graveyard in which Prophet Nuh السلام, is buried. The great Prophet Nuh, who is the great man, the greatest prophet who walked the earth, prior to whom Prophet Ibrahim السلام, The sanctity of Mecca, sanctified by the great messenger Ibrahim السلام, who in the scheme of theology, he is the second greatest prophet ever, second greatest human being to what to grace the cosmos. But thereafter is going to come one who eshbaha biya, one who, who has a bit, a striking resemblance to Ibrahim, 
or rather Ibrahim bears a striking resemblance to him. And who is that? It's the Prophet Muhammad wasallam in one of the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. And here the Prophet wasallam is the one who's going to sanctify this blessed place known as Medina. It's a place which is going to undergo radical transformation. Radical transformation in terms of space. Okay, it's known as Yathrib. Yathrib in the Arabic language, it has a bad connotation. And the Prophet وسلم, is going to forbid, forbid what the calling of that place, Yathrib. And he's going to transform it not only in name, but according to what the adage of the Arabs, the problem of the Arabs, Al Ism to Dullu Al Musamma, that names indicate the reality of things. So the transformation of the name also ushers in the transformation of the actual what? Of the actual space in and of itself. From being a place of toil and struggle and disease and epidemics, Medina is going to become a place where believers are going to be taken to new heights. Okay, real believers are going to be crafted at the highest level, such that somebody is going to be able to step foot inside of Medina and in a matter of moments completely transform from the worst of mankind to the best of mankind. That's the power of Medina to Manawara. Wasn't that easy in Mecca? Mecca you had to be tested. Mecca you had to undergo difficulty, which that difficulty. Medina presents something completely different. Also, the themes of Medina are also different. Okay? I, the themes of Medina, this is about addressing believers now. And Allah Ta'ala's address in Medina is towards the believers. Like we see verses in the Quran, Ya you and Amanu. Oh, you who believe, Allah Ta'ala is speaking to the people of what? Of belief. You hear those verses? Those verses are always Medani. They're always verses that were revealed in Medina. You hear verses, Ya Ayyuhannas, O humanity, that Khitab, Mecca, and Medani. It's for both. Those verses are revealed in both Mecca and Medina. But in Medina to Munawara, Amanu. Okay, O oh, you who believe, that's the primary address of Medina. It's addressing believers. Believers who come from Mecca, the Muhajirun, and believers who are born and raised inside of the great city in and of itself, Medina to Munawara. And they come at Wajah. The people of Medina submit almost from the get go. Prophet arrives, and the city is essentially a Muslim city now, with the arrival of the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But from the most strangest verses we see in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu, O you who believe, aminu, believe. Look, what type of khitab, what is Allah Ta'ala saying? O oh, you who believe, believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the people inside of Medina to Manawara. So it's going to be a different type of address. And it's about forging believers at the highest level of what? Of religious operation. Okay, this is the blessed city, Medina. Yathrib, as a name, it relates to toil and struggle, difficulty. Like Tithrib is like that which wears you out. It's a place that was weary. And people realized the reality of actual Medina to Manawara when it was called Yathrib the Sahaba, Abu Bakr as Siddiq, Sayyidina Bilal al Habashi, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, the Sahaba, when they arrive in Medina, they fall sick, real sick, until they believe they were on the, book, on the point of death. Why? Because Yathrib was a place that was what, overcome by disease. Okay, to the point we'll see the likes of a Siddiq al Akbar, radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr, the likes of whom Sayyidina Bilal al Habashi, they would compose poetry. And they would yearn for Mecca. The difficulties of Mecca, Sayyidina Bilal, Tahta Sakhra, is beneath a, a bowl on the hottest day in the, of the month, inside, the hottest day of the month inside of, him, inside of Mecca, and being tortured. And Sayyidina Bilal is still yearning for Mecca. That's given us an indication of the beginning days in Medina. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, and as we saw in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, of Ibn Dughanna, when he's forced to leave Mecca, he has to flee Mecca himself, and before the great Hijrah, Ibn Dughanna meets him in the hadith of Bukhari, in the area of Abu Bakr. Where are you going, Abu Bakr? He said, I have left Mecca, my people have cast me out, and I'm going to wander Allah Ta'ala's earth, worshiping Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That was the nature of Mecca for the Siddiq al Akbar, yet the difficulties of Medina caused even Abu Bakr to yearn for Mecca to Al-Mukarramah, to return back to the great city, the great city of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Medina to Allah. Okay? Until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam flexes prophecy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he takes hold of the diseases inside of Medina. This is metaphysical reality of prophecy. And often takes hold of the diseases and throws them to Juhfa. Cleans up Medina in one strike of prophecy. 
Throw to a place called Jafar. Jafar is the place that you're coming from the Sham. You're coming from the Levant, Northern Arabia, and you want to go into Ihram. The first place you smell the sanctity of the Haram is at Jafar. A place called Jafar is the Miqat for the people doing Hajj or Umrah, that blessed place. That's where the Prophet deposited all of these diseases. So make sure you don't linger in Jafar. You're just supposed to pass through quickly, make the intention for Nusuk, and then go into blessed territory. Okay? That's Jafar. But this is Medina. And from that moment, it's transformed from Yathrib to now Tayba, the beautiful place, to Medina, the archetype city, the place where religion will dwell. The, way one of the meanings of the word Medina is the crucible of religion, the crucible of higher transaction. Here, the transaction be the transaction with the Lord of all being, He subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's been a, what, in a, in a sense, set our context for this really blessed city. Naam, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, sanctified Mecca. Wa ha huwa Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. He is the sanctifier of Medina tul Munawwara. And it's an opinion as we we'll look at the various uh, traditions that relate to the superiority of Medina. There are many, especially from the school of Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, who will consider Medina tul Munawwara greater than Mecca tul, Mecca tul Mukarrama. Greater. Why? Because it's all about the one who sanctifies it. And if Mecca is great by virtue of the sanctification of Ibrahim salam, and he is the second greatest, then cave out about Medina to Munawwara, when it's sanctified by the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa by absolute consensus, he is the greatest of all, the greatest of all the Prophets. Although the majority still of the Fuqaha, they lie with Mecca, as Mecca being the most superior of all of the cities, Mecca to Mukarrama, <laughs> except that there's no dispute whatsoever about the greatest space. And that is the space, the barzakh of the Prophet ﷺ, in the epicenter of Medina to Munawwara. We will see transformation as we will see here. This is about the superiority of the city. And Sayyidina Abu Huraira rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that the Messenger of God ﷺ said, Verily, faith seeks asylum in Medina, just as a snake seeks asylum in its pit. That's faith heading towards that blessed city. And that's one of the ajaib, one of the most wondrous things that we experience, regardless of the veils, all of the darkness that we have that has encapsulated our hearts. Still today, your average believer, even your disobedient believer, he gets close to Medina to Munawara, he smells Iman. He can smell Iman, tangible, inside of that blessed city. To this day, it's something everyone experiences. Despite us, it doesn't need a level of wilaya. This needs one, the smallest amount of faith inside of your heart so that it attaches to the faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed inside of that blessed city. This is an amazing city, a really protected city. And were we to understand the sanctity of that city, we'd, have, we'd be like the likes of al Bur'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, imams, who when they're brought to the outskirts of Medina to Munawwara, they fall conscious, the great imam of the Sudan al Bur'i falls unconscious, okay, on the outskirts of Medina. Yeah, what's wrong with the Imam? They don't know. Until what? They t take him away from Medina and he comes to, he wakes. Turn him back to Medina, unconscious. He's on the outskirts. Comes to, take him away. They keep what, oscillating between the outskirts of the city. Hasn't entered the city and the direction that heads you away from what? From Medina to Munawwara. This is the power, the power of the reality of that city. Until eventually he's able to what? To gather himself such that they're able to take him inside of Medina to Munawwara. This is our history, sacred history about sacred beings. They take him inside of Medina to Munawwara. He gets in front of the Shabak, the actual what, tomb of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he dies. What type of reality is that? What type of what heart did he have? These great people, you see their sensitivity of the reality of faith was something else, something completely different. And in that sense, we always use that as a criterion to understand the great generation of Sahaba in and of themselves. Uh, right? It tells us about the nature of the companions because it was only right that every single companion should die in the presence of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you understood the power of Sayyidina Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you understood it. Uh, but you have great hearts, as in the hadith of the Muslim of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, I Allah Ta'ala chose those hearts, every single Sahaba uh, companion, to be around the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
so that they're able to sit there and withstand yani, the magnificence, the majesty of the Prophet وسلم, in, in and of himself, and ponder that, that people find it difficult. To, we have a history of people dying at the Kaaba. At the Kaaba, they die at the Kaaba. When the great woman, Bait Rabbi, Bait Rabbi, she's asking, Where's the house of my Lord? They send her towards what Mecca? Bait Rabbi, Bait Rabbi, where's the house of my Lord? They send her, they send her into the Haram. Bait Rabbi, Bait Rabbi, where's, my, where's the, Lord, the house of my Lord? They point to the Kaaba, look up, my dear woman, in front of you. She sees the Kaaba, she holds the kiss with Bait Rabbi, Bait Rabbi, Hada, Bait Rabbi. This is the house of my Lord, the house of my Lord. And she dies at the Kaaba. That's our history. People of real sensitive hearts, who the Kaaba to them is not just stone. The Kaaba to them is a living reality. It's the journey of the Kaaba in and of itself. Like you remember Junaid, Junaid ibn Muhammad al-Baghdadi rahimahullah Allah ta'ala, when he says he's making tawaf around the Kaaba, Imam Junaid, Imam al-Ta'ifatayn, the Imam of the two ways, the ways of spirituality and the ways of the law, Imam al-Junaid. And he says he's making tawaf around the Kaaba. And then he says he hears a woman in Tawaf singing poetry, singing at the Kaaba. Imam Junaid, Imam of the law, he turns towards the woman and says, Kufi, stop doing that. Yani, have Adab. House of Allah Ta'ala making Tawaf. Have Adab. You singing love poetry at the Kaaba. And then she, well, she raises her wire hands and her eyes to the, to the heavens and she says, Ya Allah, oh Allah, what can you do about stone that circumambulates stone? It's a very simple way. What are you going to do about stone? That circumambulate stone, the Kaaba. And he doesn't have a sensitive heart. Imam Junaid said as soon as those words were uttered, he fell unconscious, falls down. And the one, the Mataf, unconscious of Junaid, Rahimullah Ta'ala. He said when he came to the power of a weight, he said when he came to a Junaid, he said, I looked for the woman in the Mataf and she disappeared. And I understood she was from the hate, she was from the world of the unseen. Just different types of beings. If you only understood the nature of the Kaaba and heading towards the Haram, if you only understood, we'd find it difficult to go, real difficult to go. We'd be like the elephants of Abraha, they can't head towards the Kaaba. We'd be like Qaswa, the great being that the Prophet enters Medina to Manoah in the fair camel. This is the camel that nothing buckles. Revelation, so nuqi alayka qawlan faqila, we will thrust a heavy weight upon you. Revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that snaps necks, snaps bones when it's revealed. Yet when it's revealed upon Qaswa, Qaswa just stops, doesn't buckle, just stops chewing. The greatest beast of the Prophet sallallahu When does she buckle? When she heads towards Mecca. Hudaybiyah, you see her? Boom! Her Qaswa falls to her knees. And the Sahaba are trying to pull Qaswa, move Qaswa. And then they start saying, Qaswa is being stubborn. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that's an attribute, a virtue, an attribute that this camel does not know whatsoever, stubbornness. He says, but what has buckled Qaswa, made Qaswa kneel, is that which made the elephants of Abraha kneel. It's the Adama, the grandeur of Mecca. You see, these are hearts. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, Mecca, as you'll see in Medina, he's moving into Mecca, prostrate upon his riding beast because of the majesty of Mecca. And that's Mecca because these two, the narratives, is always about majesty and beauty. And Mecca is the manifestation of divine majesty. If you understood the nature of Mecca, you go into Mecca, your book, it breaks the necks of tyrants. That's the nature of Mecca, powerful place. And those who have sensitive hearts, mashallah, tabarakallah, they feel that, the sensitivity of Mecca, difficult to enter into it. Mm. As opposed to Medina to Munawar, it's something completely different. It's beauty, because it's dealing with unadulterated beauty. The Prophet sahib Medina to Munawar. Faith seeks asylum in Medina, just as a snake seeks asylum in its hit, the place of faith. Medina is a sanctuary from air and foam. Its trees are not cut down, and no ill is performed therein. Whoever brings forth ill therein, then the curse of God, the angels, and all of humanity is upon him. I mean, they're powerful words from the one who says, Ma bu'ithtu la'anan, I was not sent as a cursor. He is not cursing, he's just expressing the way it is, reality, as it is. And if Bukhari and Muslim, that is a sanctuary, it's a haram. In the same way Mecca is a haram. In the same way Quds is a haram. The second sanctified city, 
Likewise, also Medina to Munawwara is a haram. And the Prophet here, between air and thawr, he defines the boundaries of the haram. And here, the meaning of thawr is a, Medi is a mountain just beyond Uhud. Okay, because there's two thawrs. The thawr of Mecca, where we know the Prophet remained for the hijrah. That's Mount Thawr, but that's Mecca. This is a different thawr that is just beyond the Mount of Uhud in and of itself. And another riwayah, the Prophet said, between Ayr and Uhud, between Ayr and Uhud, showing us where the boundaries of the sanctuary of Medina to Munawwara are. Its trees are not cut down, and no ill is performed therein, a protected city, a purified city. Whoever brings forth ill therein, then the curse of God, Allah, the angels, and all of humanity is upon that individual. Okay? Likewise, we look at a hadith which related to the superiority of Medina. In the hadith of Sayyidina Abu Huraira, anha, the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi said, In the passes of Medina stand angels. Epidemics do not enter it, and neither will the Antichrist. Okay? Like Medina is protected. In the same way, Mecca is protected by mountains. You see, it's physically perfect, um, protected, and it's a fortress. In ancient Arabia, you do not find Mecca. Yani Mecca finds you. Yani it's not easy to find in ancient Arabia. Okay, the topography of where Mecca is situated. As when we looked at the issue of Sira, Allah knows best huh, where he places his message. And he placed what the message in the Prophet وسلم, in a fortress, which is Mecca to Mukarrama. Okay, and that's important in terms of the preservation of the universal message. Medina is, is very different, radically different. It's open. One could walk into Medina. There's no sort of physical boundaries that are really protected Medina in the same way as Mecca. But Medina is protected by beings of light, angels. Okay? That's why it's the city of light, one of its meanings. The illuminated city by these great angels that stand in protection. Like one of the Imams of Saqqaf, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, he asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in the same way that you protect me, surround me, protect me, encircle me, in the same way you've encircled Medina to Rasul, in the same way you've encircled the city of the Messenger, i.e. with the Malaika, with angels in and of themselves. And it's in that sense, epidemics do not enter it, they were dealt with, a deadly blow by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and neither will the Antichrist. And the Messiah Dajjal, who is able to enter into every single city on the face of the earth, except the harams, the three haram. He cannot enter Mecca, protected. cannot enter Medina, protected. And likewise, Quds Sharif. Okay, on an opinion that he cannot enter Quds. Okay, but Medina is the most obvious. And he just stands upon the mount. The mount where King Fahad built his wall, built his palace. Exact place is known in the Hadith of Sahih, of where the Antichrist stands. And from it, he can see the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, which he calls the White Castle. And that's why when the, the, the masjid is made, quote-unquote, out of white marble in recent times, that's a sign of the proximity of the Antichrist in and of himself. Because he calls it the Al-Qasr al abyad And he asks, whose white castle is that? Whose white palace is that? And they say, that is the palace of Ahmed. He's told the Antichrist did Dajjal. Can't enter into the city. He's on the, what, the outskirts of it. Although some of the fuqaha, they debate with regards to it, which is important for us. They debate, i.e., where is Medina? We looked at the tradition between Ayr and Thaw. Is the haram. But is that what the Prophet Sallallahu was meaning in the tradition? That it cannot, they cannot enter Medina to Munawwara, the Antichrist. And yani there are those from amongst the, the, the teacher of the faqih, Marab al Hajj, who's of the opinion it's not the city that exists today, but it's the city as it existed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that that is Medina. And obviously the city of the Prophet Sallallahu is all inside the masjid. Okay? I like the masjid in and of itself. That's where the original city of Medina to Munawwara is. Okay? But there are many, and that's Allah Ta'ala Alam, whether it's the majority, we consider it's the entire city. Okay? I, the city as it stands today is completely protected by what? By the angels so that the Antichrist will not enter therein. Uh, but the reality is, yeah, and if you're in Medina, what's your business in the city? Your business is in the mosque. That's what your business is. And um, whoever renders his business inside of the mosque of the Prophet, no doubt whatsoever, on both positions is protected. 
in very precarious times. And these are times that are fastly approaching. And anybody who is not sensitive to that, then is somebody who is completely missing the point that in the world in which we have been amazed in this current day and age. Okay? On the authority of Abu Hurairah who said the Messenger of God وسلم, said prayer in this mosque of mine is more than a thousand times superior to a prayer in other than it save the sacred mosque. Okay? I had a mosque of the, of the Haram in and of itself of Mecca. All the rewires which most rendered the dominant 10,000 times. Okay? 10,000 times. And Al-Quds is 1,000 times. Okay? And there's other rewires that allude to it being 100,000 times superior. Okay, and with the rewire substantiate in Mecca, that's one million times. Although the dominant for Mecca is a hundred thousand, and Medina for ten thousand times superior. Okay, the power of what we call al-amal is one rakah in Medina to Munawar. On this rewire, it's one thousand times greater. Okay, and another what rewires, it's ten thousand times greater. Okay, Allah yudaifu kama yasha Allah subhanahu wa taala multiplies as He pleases. But again, the superiority of place. Tradition that Sayyidina Abu Hurairah who said the Messenger of God وسلم, said between my house and my pulpit is one of the meadows of paradise and my pulpit is upon my basin. And a hadith that are strange, something that what well, with the outward in senses that we can't understand the reality of what the Prophet وسلم, is saying. The hadith in Sahih Bukhari in Muslim, the Sharih of Al-Bukhari, Ibn Abi Jamra rahimahullah ta'ala, he said the hadith, يعني, in the ala haqiqatihi, that these are literal, okay, they're not, it's not metaphor, he's speaking, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I, between my house and another riwayah, between the house of Aisha, Hujrat al-Aisha, and my pulpit, Rodam in Riyad al-Jannah, is one of the meadows of paradise. Uh, and Ibn Abi Jamra says, literally, it's a meadow of paradise, uh, it's from the other world, from Jannah. But again, you need sensitive hearts in order to, to understand the reality of what the Beit Araf is saying. But likewise, he also says that if Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and my pulpit is upon my basin, in the hole, the great basin, the greatest basin Allah Ta'ala has created, the hole of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every Prophet has a hole, except that the most superior hole, basin, is that of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam, that of the dominant opinion lies between the Passover of hell and paradise, that's where this hole lies, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, other opinions, it lies before the Sirat, the Passover. Other opinions that lies in the midst of the Sirat. Other opinions that lies inside the paradise. But it's overworldly. It's from the topography of the overworld. When the whole universe is what? Is recreated. And things which exist right now. The whole exists right now. In the same way paradise and gender exists right now. They take their resting places in the topography of the other world. And the Prophet is telling us that the mimbar. Inside of his masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa is upon my hold. Okay, how, how do you understand that? It's not something that you can understand with this, with the, with the, with the confines of your own limited intellect. But this is about spirit, it's about soul. True metaphysics. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who said the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa said, A prophet does not die, save that he is buried in the exact place that he dies. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. All these traditions are alluding to what the grandeur of Medina tul Munawwara, the grandeur of the soil of the Medina of Medina tul Munawwara, in a place that has literally pieces of paradise. That's why we speak about Medina, a place that the hold the most superior basin, the one who drinks from the water of that hold, shall never be thirsty thereafter. That part of it is in Medina tul Munawwara. A place in which what? The soil of which is the soil from which the Prophet ﷺ was crafted. In the tradition that we are crafted, made from the soil where we are buried. That's where we're created from. Uh, so the soil that the Prophet ﷺ was created from, hey, it's taken from Medina to Munawwara. Uh, the soil that Abu Bakr ﷺ was created from, hey, Medina to Munawwara. The soil that whom Umar ibn Khattab was created from, where? Medina tul Munawwara. Look, Meccans, they're from Mecca, but they were created from the soil of Medina. The soil of which Bid'atul Mustafa, Zahra al-Batul, radiallahu ta'ala anha wa alayhi salam, was created from, hey, Medina tul Munawwara. The soil of which Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Dhul Nurayn, created from, Medina tul Munawwara. And the soil from which Isa ibn Maryam, 
Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam, created from where? Medina tul Munawwara. Wouldn't you think that's blessed soil? Real blessed soil. One of the shiuch mentioned to one of our teachers, Habib Ali, that he was on a plane, okay, he left Medina to Munawwara, and you say everybody wants a souvenir from Medina, so he took some soil. <laughs> his, this is the Ali souvenir. You know, most of us, it's what is it? Gold, whatever. <coughs> Maybe some of you can't afford gold, so it's a misfah. Or a bit of dates, you know, Zamzam, maybe, that was all taken to Medina. We have different things we seek in Medina. This, mashallah, blessed individual, he sought some soil, and some stones from Medina to Manawara. That's what he took as his souvenir, mashallah. And he took it, and he said he was on a plane, telling us to have Ali Jifri. He's on a plane, and when he's on the plane, he hears something crying. He's like, what's, what's that? Sensitive heart here. He hears something crying. And then he looks inside of his what, of his bag, and it's the soil that is crying, crying. Uh, taking me from Medina. And then he promised the soil. He said, the only way the soil fell silent is when I promised the soil, I'm going to take you back. And then the soil, mashallah. And it's a contract between me and you. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether we believe those stories or not. Any truth doesn't, rep, doesn't rest upon our belief. doesn't whatsoever. Allah Ta'ala says, doesn't increase truth one iota, okay? But these are realities, whether we are well cognizant, cognizant of them or not. This is the blessed place, Medina to Munawwara, the place of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. You know, the most beautiful things we see from this tradition, the most beautiful things from this tradition extrapolated, is that a prophet does not die, say that he is buried in the exact place that he dies, Tayyip. Okay? Take the example of Isa ibn Maryam. What's Isa ibn Maryam doing at the Shubak? And he's buried at the Shubak. The last space of the house of Aisha is reserved for whom? Isa ibn Maryam. To this day reserved for Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam. None of the Sahaba were buried. They, they desired to be buried there until they were aware of the secret behind it. And they say the Hassan desired to be buried sift of the Prophet وسلم, until he was aware from the tradition from Aisha, Kitab al Aisha, that nobody's buried in that place. And that's what made Sayyidina Hussein Sakal when he understood that Sayyidina Hassan could not be buried right there in the Shubak of Aisha, inside of the room of Aisha. That's what Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam. But the key is what Isa doing at the Shubak? Uh, yani there we're getting an inkling of the last moments of Jesus, the son of Mary, after his final descent. Like his last moments is Taslim al Rasul. Sending salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi That's his last moments. That's how he leaves the world, Jesus, son of Mary. So that he dies in that blessed place and he's buried yani beneath the ground in which he stood. Sending salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam and alayhi. Shows you uh, the greatness of these beings. Jesus! Uh, Jesus returns just to give salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa as if, as if. And if we as believers can't take those type of meanings from Sirah, then Kaif, hey, what's the purpose? You might as well go and study the life and times of Michelangelo. <laughs> might as well. And if it's just a, a, a history we want to get from this, but it's not transformation, it's not purity, it's not sensitivity of souls. And it's just different ways we can approach sacred history. And that's the reason why while Muslims are not interested in history and historical figures, we're not very good at history as Muslims. We don't have a tradition like others of history. Except when it comes to the Blessed One, we have volumes upon the Prophet ﷺ. We can tell you things about him that nobody can what, inform you about people who live to this day. And it, not interested in those subtleties of people's lives, but we are interested in every single subtlety of the life of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. The Masjid, the Mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. And again, in this, just as Medina is transformed as a city, in the mosque is some of the great sort of higher meanings of Medina, are about the transformation of human character. Some of the ulama render this the greatest miracle other than the Quran of the Prophet ﷺ, how he's able to transform the character of human beings. You see, like, look at the test that Allah Ta'ala subjugated the Prophet ﷺ, uh, to. Yani, he gave the Prophet ﷺ, from the outward, the worst type of human beings. Go and transform them. And look who he gave. Like the worst type of human beings imaginable. Allah Ta'ala gave them to the Messenger of Allah. Transform their souls. 
Prophet takes the likes of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, wa arda, look how Umar ends, look at the end of Umar, look at the transformation that Umar underwent, under the watchful eye of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dua inwardly and outwardly, look at the fierce moments of the Prophet and saying to Umar ibn al-Khattab, is it not time ya Umar, violently shaken Umar, Umar falls crying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet raises his hands to Allah, oh Allah, replace the ghil, the rancor in the heart, of Umar and embed faith. Look at the first thing he's concerned about the transformation of dispositions, trans- transformation of the character of Umar ibn Khattab. That's the great meaning of Medina, the great meaning of Islam in general, the transformation of human beings. And we are as close to Islam as what well, in the transformation each and every single one of us have undergone in the deen. You see, if it's all about this, uh, the intellect, we know something about religion, but there's no transformation in character, and khalas mefi fa'idah. There's no more benefit inside of our engagement of deen. And if we leave like this doubts, and there's not some type of transformation, determination to be transformed, and khalas, there's no benefit whatsoever. <coughs> and it's all about the transformation of the self. So we become higher selves, we become beings that can be what lights that walk amongst humanity and guide them to Allah Ta'ala, Nur al-Samawati wal Ard. That's the nature of deen, that's the reality of religion. The mosque also signifies this idea, the history of the mosque in and of itself. A mosque founded on taqwa from the first day. Uh, the, the, the verse is Surah Tawbah. Uh, a lot are going to render that, and some say it's the dominant, Quba, the first mosque built in that sacred territory, Quba, the mosque of Quba. Although, as we see in the tradition, that it also relates to one, the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu on Ifaj Abu Sa'id al Khudri, who said, I visited the Messenger of God وسلم, in the house of one of his wives, and thereby asked, O oh, Messenger of God, which of the two mosques is the one that was established upon God consciousness? So he وسلم, took a handful of pebbles, throwing them upon the ground. Then he said, It is this mosque of yours. Okay? I, the Messenger of the Prophet وسلم, and of himself. So the, no doubt it was established upon taqwa, and likewise, no doubt, Quba. But which one does the verse apply to? The ulama are an ikhtilaf. Both the reality, they're both in misajid, mosques, the first two mosques that were established upon taqwa. And that's important because if mosques are not established upon taqwa, you know, the commandment of the Prophet وسلم, in Surah Tawbah, he called those mosques masjid al dirar, harmful mosques. And the Prophet وسلم, commanded for them to be brought down to the ground. And it brought down because the people had ulterior motives why they established those edifices. You see, it looks like a mosque, but the reality is to distract from the Prophet Sallallahu To distract, okay? It's like somebody can read the Qur'an. Can you imagine somebody reading the Qur'an for an ulterior motive outwardly? You want to distract from the Messenger of Allah. In the time of the Messenger, there were those who used to recite, the only verse they would recite inside of what? Inside of prayer was Abasa wa Tawalla. And they would recite Abasa, trying to use the Qur'an to what? To mock the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when the Prophet Sallallahu tells us, Rubba and Yal'anu in Quran. There are many of those who recite the Quran and the Quran curses them. Ulterior motive, not purity. You're going to use the, and render the butt of mockery, the Quran. Try to render the message of Allah, the butt of mockery. Some people are mad. Likewise, also the building of masajid. You see, not the yu'li, kalimatillah, not to raise the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to raise their own nufus, to raise their own sun'ah, to distract hearts towards them, true distraction, it's not for the sake of peace subhanahu wa ta'ala. That by and large, on a level, is like the masajid and institutions that we all build in this day and age of ours. My mosque, his mosque, this group's mosque, that group's mosque. No, no, no. Al Masajid Lillah. Mosques are Allah's. And if you have to really understand that the mosque is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for anybody or their group or their people or their nationality. La. Allah refuses that. The Messenger of Allah Ta'ala refuses that. And these are meanings that we have to give life to. Give life. Okay? Otherwise they can become harmful mosques. Not that they should be brought down to the ground, although Qadi Abu Bakr al-Arabi in, in, in Ahkam al-Quran will allude to that. They should be brought down to the ground. But what? We should rectify, we should be brought down to the ground, rectify our intentions of why we approach sacred territory or sacred edifices. Why? 
Imam comes to Imam Abdullah al-Haddad rahimahullah ta'ala and he instructs him that he, want, he asks that he wants to build a mosque and he's got the money gathered. Imam al-Haddad says, Ta'a, bring, the, bring the wealth, bring the money for to build the masjid. So he brings the wealth and he gives it to Imam al-Haddad, Abdullah al-Haddad, the great mujadid. And he says to Imam, Imam al-Haddad says to him, ah, yeah. so when we build the mosque, we will say Fulan ibn Fulan built it, someone else built it. And he says, no, 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 that's, that's my money. It should be someone else built it. No, I financed the mosque. Imam al-Haddad said, ah, so it's not for Allah Ta'ala, is it? Yeah. You see, you want to be known that you are behind that? You've got to watch the motives here, ulterior motives here. And if it's really for Allah, you don't care. Uh, if what people know it's you or not. And in fact, those at a lower level would rather that they be not be known in the beginning of their wayfaring unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. It was so important, the mosque and it's the first thing the Prophet sets about doing. And the Prophet sallallahu the three things the Prophet sallallahu sets about doing as he enters into Medina from Munawwara. And the first is the construction of the religious edifice. Because Medina is about religion, and that's the masjid. And the second is the Prophet sallallahu is going to make sure that what? A dunya mazra'at al akhirah. Let ten say nasiba come in a dunya. It's going to ensure that what? The Sahaba can survive in Medina. So he sets about building, reconstructing a new economy. That at first, the Jews have hegemony over what? Over money that is circulated inside the Bidin to Manawara. They have hegemony control over the souk, over the marketplace. And the Prophet Wasallam, rather than what? Creating what? Confrontation with the Jews. He says, we build a separate economy. We build a separate what? Souk. That's the second thing. And then the third thing is about the relationship between what those who arrive in Medina and those who are traditional what inhabitants of Medina. The Ba'akha, the pact of the brothers, okay, of the various what brothers between the, the, the Meccans and the, and the Medanis, the Ansar, inside of Medina. But only the first three. Right now we're focusing upon the mosque in and of itself, its construction. And again, the issue here is transformation. On the authority of Anas ibn Malik who said, when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, he stayed in the highlands amongst the people known as the clan of Amr ibn Awf. He ﷺ stayed in Medina amongst them for 14 nights. Then he sent a message ﷺ to some of the tribe of Najjar upon issuing the command to build the mosque, saying, O clan of Najjar, name me your price for this orchard of yours. It's the place where Qaswa buckles. They replied, by God, we are in no need of its price, except of that which comes from God. And khalas, we want our reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the Prophet sallallahu refused to accept it from them, i.e. as a gift, insisting that they sold it to him. You understand? The masjid, that was financed by the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his own wealth. And then he rebuilt it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a mosque. Hadith al-Bukhari, therein were the graves of idolaters. I, that space was a graveyard for the worst type of human form that we have, which are forms that worship idols, min dunillah, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was what that space was. And from the worst type of form to the best form, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. It still remains as a graveyard. But it's the best that people now transformed. Uh, and then also dilapidated buildings. From buildings that are muharrab falling down to the ground. And that is Qasr Ahmed. The palace of Ahmed it becomes. The great edifice, the masjid of the Prophet And from date palm trees, a bit low down in the hierarchy of life, the pyramid of life, to what to believe is, as in the hadith of Al-Bukhari, transformed. And do you know the day palm, yani, the believer um, resembles what? What does the believer represent, yani, um, resemble? Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar raised the tradition, said, I was there with my father, Umar ibn Khattab. And I was like, I know the answer. I know the answer. For he knows, look at the adab. He looks at his father, sakit, silent. Abu Bakr, sakit, silent. Looks at the, the fuhu, great ones of the Sahaba, sakit, they're all silent. So he realizes, I think I should be silent as well. Doesn't speak. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, What tree resembles the believer? It's the day palm tree, a nakhla. It resembles the believer. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar says, When I stood with my father to leave the majlis of Nabuwa, 
that in the gathering of prophecy, I said to my father, and he, he said, Father, I knew the answer, I knew the day palm tree. He said, Umar said, why didn't you speak? You would have made me so proud. Uh, you just said, the day palm tree, Ya Rasulullah. Uh, so these are day palm trees that are inside the, uh, the masjid. Yeah, they resemble the believer, okay, upright creatures. And they're going to remain in the mosque for a different purpose. One of them, that's going to be the great day palm tree. That is with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi dunya wa akhira hadith mutawatir. And when he denies it, exits the fold of religion, that one supreme day palm tree that began to cry and cry and cry and cry when the Prophet left the day palm tree. Only a few step, footsteps away, when this beautiful woman from the Ansar had built the Prophet a minbar, a three-step minbar. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam placed it there. This was the first day he was going to step on the minbar. And then as he moves towards the minbar, people can hear crying inside of the masjid. Masjid. And he turns, and it's the date palm tree that is crying. And look at the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rahmah, Lilkul, mercy to all creation, the entire world. He takes the date palm tree and begins to caress and stroke the date palm tree. Look at the tenderness. Look at the care. If the believers, he's compassionate, he's mercy. This is a believer, day palm tree. It's crying due to Mufaraqa, due to the fact that the Blessed Prophet is leaving its side. He used to lean on it when he gave the khutbah, and that movement away caused deep pain inside of the day palm tree. Believe that. Sayyidina Abu Huraira used to say to the Tabi'een, he used to say, a day palm tree cried over the Prophet Sallallahu and what about you? Abu Huraira would say, رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاه, cry. The Prophet begins to speak to the day palm tree, and then a the day palm tree falls silent, and the Prophet Sallallahu informs the Sahaba, I, I ask the day palm tree, the choice is yours. I can remain with you in the world, but you will forgo the next world. Or, you let me go to the actual member and you will be with me in the other world and you will be tree from which the people of paradise take fruit. The choice is yours. Look what the day palm tree chose. And anybody who's attached to the Prophet Sallallahu couldn't care less about the dunya. <laughs> so he chooses the other world and the eternality with the Messenger of Allah and being a, a, a source of substance for believers in paradise. He chooses the next world. Shuf, al-ibra. Think about that. Chooses the next world. Uh, but look, the one who chooses the next world gets the best of both worlds. So the Prophet and commanded for the day palm tree. He couldn't live in the world without the Messenger of Allah. Bring it down. Couldn't live. Bring the day palm tree down and bury it beneath the member. Sure. So we get the best of both worlds. The blessed feet of the Prophet is over the day palm tree inside of the world. And in the next world, mashallah, tabarakallah. And in the barzakh, look how close he is. Huh? He's on one side of Rodam in Riyadh al-Jannah and the Prophet is on the other side. Look at the beauty. Just for choosing the other world, the day palm tree, because of his hanan, his love, his care for the Messenger of Allah, look what he gets. The best of dunya, best of barzakh, best of the akhirah. Wa antum, and as for yourselves. Wa nahn, and as for us. Hey, we've got to reevaluate our Allah, our relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Reevaluate it. So the Prophet sallallahu issued the order with regards to the graves of the idolaters, so they were exhumed. And then the dilapidated buildings were leveled and the day palm trees chopped down. They thereby lined up the day palm trees facing the direction of the house. Okay? This being what? The Kaaba in and of itself. They began to hold rocks in their arms, transporting the rocks, singing with the Prophet sallallahu alongside them. There is no good save the good of the hereafter. So forgive. So, yeah, so forgive the helpers and the migrants. Allahumma ghfir al Al Ansar wal Muhajira, La Aisha illa Aish al Akhira, Allahum Mughfir, Al Ansar wal Muhajira, okay, the tradition. On the authority of Nafir, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, who said, Verily, during the lifetime of the Messenger of God, وسلم, the mosque was built using adobe bricks, mud bricks. The roof was made from date palm branches, and its pillars were from wood. 
Abu Bakr never changes the structure at all. It's what the mosque was made out of. Umar slightly altered it, rebuilding its structure in accordance with how it was during the lifetime of the Prophet using adobe bricks and date palm branches and once again using wooden pillars. Just like in the time of the Messenger, maybe illusion that it had been destroyed, part of it, due to the elements. So he rebuilt it, reconstructed it. And also what we do know that Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab added to the mosque was suraj, lights, okay, torches. He put torches in the mosque. The first time the mosque was ever lit was in the time of Umar ibn Khattab. Time of the Messenger, no lights by night. And that's why whom the Munafiqun, the Munafiqun, when the Prophet in Bukhari tells us, Ashaddu Salah, the most difficult Salah, prayer upon the hypocrites, is Fajr and Isha. Why? Pitch black. Okay, on certain nights so the Munafiqun could just not tear up. Nobody would see them, that's what they thought. Nobody would know if we're here or not. You couldn't be seen in the time of the Messenger due to intense darkness. Okay? Time of Abu Bakr, the same. Umar ibn Khattab, la. And from the bid'ah of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, is that he brings lights into the mosque. That's a good bid'ah, do you reckon? I'm with you. That's a good bid'ah. Ni'mah bid'ah to heavy, as Umar would say. What a beautiful bid'ah is this. That's the statement of Umar with regards to Taraweeh. And no doubt it applies to what the suruj, to these lanterns that he placed inside of the masjid. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, Uthman's beautiful, uh, altered it, making several significant adjustments to it. He built the walls using carved stone and plaster, and he used carved stone pillars and an ebony roof. That is, it undergoes a radical change in Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan is the one who brings in a lot of stuff brand new. But he's, he's got the maqam, he's got the rank, he can do that. And in, in traditions, he calls the Prophet you know what he calls the Prophet My companion. <laughs> okay, if Uthman would call Sahibi, he called the Prophet my companion, that's rank. I mean, you can do that. And the Prophet was shy of Uthman. And Abu Bakr would be there, he'd be relaxed, Salah alayhi wa sallam. Umar would be there, he'd be relaxed. Uthman would walk in. He'd straighten himself up, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, get all proper. And they would ask, what? Well, yeah, Rasulullah, why do you do that? And the Prophet would say, a person who angels are shy of. And the angels are shy of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu wa arda. Okay? Uh, that's Sayyidina Uthman. Uthman is the first one to introduce the sandal. You know the sandal? The one in the sandal. The only the one thong, that's Uthman. Before that, Abu Bakr, Umar, all of them two thongs, like the sandal of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Uthman brings him a lot of stuff. Uthman sahib al-Qur'an, Uthman sahib of two adhans. A lot of things Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an, brings into the ummah. That's really important for us. You see when we have the bid'ah brigade, you see where everything that moves, sayhatun alayhim. You see some type of war, aberration from the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And people mefahimu. They haven't understood religion, haven't understood religion. Khalafu, they've gone against what, what the people have said with Senate transmission to this day of ours. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, indeed you will adorn it just as it was, as it was adorned by the Jews and the Christians. And I was speaking about the end of times in Abdullah ibn Abbas, that you will adorn it. He's not speaking from his own what, his own words. It's like the Hukm al it's in al Bukhari, like Hukm al He's speaking about future events. That no doubt was conveyed to him by the Prophet That's the nature of future events. That although it's a Sahaba who utters them, we understand in these type of things, they don't speak from themselves. It's something they've taken from Janib and Nabuwa, from the Prophet of, in and of himself And we want to go to look at our mosques. Now, how much do you think the message of the Prophet doesn't cost to build? Put a price on it. Now not a price of what it's worth, because if you do, you haven't understood the mosque. It's priceless. You can't put a price upon the master that prophesied and built, financed with his own money and built with his own hands, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can't put a price on that. But we can put prices upon the mosques we built. The mafhum of it, like 60 million, 100 million, type of mosques that we build in this day of ours. Masjid. And the adornment of masajid are the believers, the hearts of believers. That's the zukhruf of the masajid, that's what adorns mosques, that's what adorns space, that's what makes space special. Believing cards, great souls, not chandeliers and expensive what, tiles and, no. And that's a sign that we have 
fell into that which the Prophet ﷺ feared for us. He said, I don't fear polytheism, idolatry for you. Then I don't fear shirk, shirk for the ummah. We're protected from it. But I fear what the will that you will begin to vie and compete for it. The Prophet ﷺ said, it's a mushkila, it's a musiba. How even the most sacred of all places, we've made it a place of the world and not a place of the other world. Again, we forgot that which the Prophet ﷺ came with. Look at the Bedu, that Bedu there in the hadith of the Bukhari and Muslim. That Bedu comes to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and begins to urinate. Urinate inside of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Where does he think he is? Sahaba saw him, they wanted to pounce on him. The Sahaba, and the Muslim stops the Sahaba and they said, Let him finish. And he's in the midst of urination, let the man finish. And then he finished, and the Prophet instructs the Sahaba, go and get water and just throw it over it. So we know it, a hadith of one, of Ahkam. Just put the water over the urine and it'll just cleanse it. The Prophet summons him, and that's the bed. Like, what do you do with there? And he's, he, say, he says, What do you mean? He says, The Prophet this is a mosque, place of worship. It's a mosque. I thought it was a place you kept animals. Look what he's seen with the physical. I thought you kept animals in this place. Well, didn't know it was a mosque. Huh? And what type of mosque was it if you saw it with your own eyes? Do you think it resembled the type of structures that we build? Huh? And then the Bedouin says to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Muhammad irfa' yadayk. Oh Muhammad raise your hands. And if a dua. And then he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma khfiruli. Oh Allah forgive me first and foremost. Yeah, I did something wrong right there. And then he said, and forgive the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi forgive him also because look how he dealt with me look at the compassion, the kindness, the tenderness and the way he dealt with me when I did something really wrong and then he said, oh Allah don't forgive any of these, see all these men who wanted to pounce on me but now don't forgive any single one of them take them all to account for that bad idea that they have in me the bedu, real people yani, real people, that's important the nature of the bedu, also the nature of the people of Mecca, real people because inside the Medina, as we'll go on to, we're going to see a different type of people up here. Uh, number three right there. Munafiqun. Different types of people begin to manifest in Medina. Unheard of in Arabian history. Arabs don't have nifaq. They don't have hypocrisy. They're like black and white types of people. Yani. And if they don't like you, they'll tell you that. If they like you, they'll tell you that. Yani, khalas, their hearts, as we say, are on their sleeves. Okay, that's the nature of the Arabs, and that's the nature of Mecca. One of the beauties of Mecca was that it was very clear on what side people stood. Very clear. There was no one in between, no nifaq in Mecca. That phenomena is a phenomenon that manifests inside of Medina to Munawwara, inside of Medina. And yani for reasons, and one of the outward reasons is power now. Okay, it's power. Now, now the power of prophecy is established in Medina to Munawwara. So some people, although they disbelieve, they just got to pretend to go along. Okay? That always manifests, seeing it. When it's weak, then khalas. If religion's weak, why be a hypocrite? Then it's weak. There's no vested interest in what? In pretending to be a Muslim. Okay? However, if religion is powerful, now there's vested interest at this point in time. Okay? Vested interest. Likewise, they also make mention of it. Allah Ta'ala Alam, yani with it. But it's mentioned that also the influence of the Jews of Medina, okay, the influence of the Jews in and of themselves, that they had exacted the influence upon elephants of Medina from Munawwara to create a new class of people. Those who went against Tabi'atul Arab, went against the, the innate nature of the Arabs, which they're not Munafiqun, they're not hypocrites. <laughs> they're straightforward, straight talking people in their arsal, okay. And then likewise, also a third reason, which is clear, is that the munafiqun generally are from one type of people. Who are those? They're going to be people who are what? They're shuyukh. They're old. And they're leaders. They have power inside of Yathrib. But with the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu all of that power is uprooted, taken away from them. So no doubt it is about the love and the desire for power. Okay? But it's also about something about those who are what? Who are beyond the bridge of 40, that they become very difficult to change. And that's a, that's a consistent rule, Mecca and Medina. It's a rule, a rule of form, a rule of law. That the Prophet ﷺ himself when I came, said, when I came, the shuyukh denied me. 
old people denied me. They went against me, stood against me in both Mecca as well as Medina. Problem with Mecca, Allah Ta'ala allowed the shuyukh of Mecca to live and to have power to face prophecy. Okay? And as a class, they virtually all die in the depths of disbelief. The shuyukh of Mecca, the leaders of Mecca, the walids of the world, the amrs of the world, Amr ibn Hisham Abu Jahl, those type, Uqba ibn Abu Ma'id, those type, they all die in the, in, under the war, the chains of disbelief. They couldn't go beyond their own tabi'ah. What did Allah Ta'ala do in Medina, in the Hadith of Sahih? What did He do with Medina? He brought war about between the Ansar and the Khazraj. They went to war. It was the most deadly war that they ever fought, called the Bu'ath. In tradition, Allah brought that about for the reason. Why? To take out the leadership, the shuyukh, so that the Prophet Sallallahu would not face the opposition that he faced inside of Mecca. And basically, the entire <coughs> leadership of Medina was killed inside of what's called the Battle of Bu'ath, which is referred to as we see inside of the verse. The entire leadership was killed, okay? Apart from a few remained, and they as a class become the Munafiqun. Those few who survived. And all of the new leadership that emerged, all of the youth, they all become Muslim overnight. Overnight they all become Muslim. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, Usaid. All of them become Muslim. With the, with, the, with the engagement saying the Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala an. So what we see here are the four different types of people inside of Medina to Munawwara. The first are the Muhajirun. And the Muhajirun are the people of Hijra. They're the people of Mecca. Those who leave Mecca by and large for what? Medina to Munawwara. They're the Muhajirun. But likewise also there are those who make Hijra to Medina from other places. They're not from Mecca. Some of them don't even experience Mecca. But not only are they people of Hijra once, they can be people of Hijra twice. And like an example of whom? The great Qari of Quran, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is from a place in Yemen, a place called Zabid, from the tribe of the Ash'ari. And he takes the boat in the Red Sea to, to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yemen is hit. The great Da'i of Yemen is whom? His name is Abu, Abu Tufail al-Dawsi. Abu Tufail al-Dawsi, amazing companions, engages the Prophet in Mecca, becomes Muslim. Mecca is too dangerous. Prophet sends him back to Yemen. Go back to Yemen and what? Um, convert your people, call your people to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Look at the transformation this individual Abu Tufayl al -Dawsi. He leaves Mecca and then he's hit, hit the Tihama, the desert that leads right back to the Yemen. Okay? And Mecca is north Tihama, Zabid is south Tihama, all on the Red Sea coast. He hits the desert and Radiallahu ta'ala and when he hits the desert, he hits pitched. In darkness, and the darkness of the night, a moonless night, and he said, as he's walking in the darkness of the desert, boom, his face lights up. A miracle that his face becomes a torch in the desert, and he walks through the desert with his face light and go through the desert. He said, as he approaches Zabir, okay, his homeland, his country, his place in the Yemen, he begins to pray to Allah Ta'ala, Oh Allah, not in my face. You're going to think I'm a freak. <laughs> I'm going to enter into, what, into Medina and into, into Zabin and my face is boom, lit up. They don't understand that. So he said, not in my face, Ya Allah. And he said, Allah took it from his face and put it in his staff. And then his staff was his torch by which he guided himself through the desert. And amazing. These, these, what of that's an Anbiya? These are the ears of the prophets. Read the Bible of Nawi, Rahimullah. Yahya Sharaf Adina, Nawi, Imam Nawi. He said at night when he used to watch study his books, his finger would light up as a torch. And now the one who's, when he, he slept in front of a, of, a, of a pillar, a concrete pillar, so assiduous in worship and study. And now in Allah, they had a concrete pillar in front of him as he studied. And then when he dropped off, his head, boom, would hit the pillar, he'd wake up. And that was the sleep of Naomi. Those, those moments. That's how he slept. And he was so attached to his what to his studies, Imam Nawawi Rahimullah is writing that when it was dark, he didn't even poor, couldn't have what torches, fire in his house, that his finger whoop, would just light up for him, Nawawi, so he could carry on what reading. Uh, from the generation of the Sahaba, we see this under the great ears of prophecy and of themselves. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, when he was, he's of those who who. who who's from those who engaged the great Abu Tufayl al-Dawsi. That's where this Islam comes from. And he says he takes the, a boat in the Red Sea, 
to Medina, he was Muslim, left to Medina to Manawara, he had to Medina. Uh, what is it? He shipwrecked in the Red Sea into Abyssinia. And he goes to Abyssinia, who's there? Uthman, Jafar, Sahaba in Abyssinia. So he just hangs out in Abyssinia until the Zaman of Khaybar, until Prophet commands for the world of Sahaba to return from Abyssinia to face Hijra to Medina. He arrives with the great Imams of the Sahaba, saying the Jafar, the leader at that point in time. They arrived inside of Medina to Manawara at Khaybar, at the Battle of Khaybar. And the Prophet Sallallahu instructs Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, you're of those who made two Hijras. This is the people of the Hijratain, those who made Hijra to Abyssinia and also Hijra to Medina. But Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was from them, although his intention was Medina. Khalas, he ended up in Abyssinia, radiallahu ta'ala. So these are the emigrants, the Muhajirun, generated from Mecca, but they can be from other places. The helpers of the Ansar, the two great tribes, who are what? Aws and Khazraj. Aws and the Khazraj. They're originally Yemenis from Yemen. Okay, they're from a place which is around what we'd call now in the Quranic language, Saba. Okay, what's now called Ma'rib, Ma'rib. They're from a place, Saba, where the queen of Sheba was from, Sheba. Saba is Sheba. And it's the place where the dam of what? The great dam of the Yemen, which is called the Sadd al Ma'rib. The dam of Ma'rib is to this very day, although it's no longer the great dam it was in the ancient world. But the nature of that dam, it would periodically flood. Okay, when it would walk, it would, it would flood. Yeah, it, it would walk, it would destroy the civilizations around it. And eventually it causes the inhabitants to leave Ma'rib and to head north. And they head north to what is then called Yathrib. Two Yemeni tribes, Aus and Khazraj. And they take what route inside of what? Inside of the place called Yathrib, which later becomes Medina to Munawara. So the Yemenis inside of it are also both of those tribes. Okay, both tribes. And that place is a really dangerous place. It's a place of people of war to this very day. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ in the Hadith of Mecca saying that Khabar ibn Ratin al Bukhari, that what, yani Allah, that you timbullah al amar, Allah will complete this affair until a rider can go from Sana'a to Hadramaut, the Prophet ﷺ, fearing nothing whatsoever. In other words, like even a wolf, a, sh a shepherd would not even fear a wolf. Okay? No fear, it's a time of absolute peace and security, the Prophet Sallallahu said. What, what is it between Sana'a and Hadramaut? That's of the most dangerous territories in the entire world. That's Ma'rib. Okay, it's a place of people to this day. You go through Yemen, you do, I used to do that trip regularly. And when you get to that point in time, AK-47, like the OK Karal or the OK Ma'rib or whatever it is, they all step, not just yeah, the AKs, kids, AKs, they got belts of like a hundred bullets all over them. Like, what's up with these people, Yanni? It's like, a, it's like something else when you hit that territory. And that's where the Ansar came from. And that's important. Because the Ansar, as we saw, of the people of the same place. What do they call themselves in the Quran? Urubets. We're people of power. And people who are skilled in warfare. That's what they tell the Queen of Sheba. Okay, that's the nature of that place. And the Ansar also Urubets in. That's why they're chosen. They're going to be chosen people by Allah Ta'ala because they're going to be one of the fierce protectors of prophecy. Our swords are dripping with blood. They will tell the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi People of intense power, skill in warfare. And their tawfiq, what's the tawfiq of war of the Ansar? Is that they live in the same territory as the Jews and Medina Tul Munawwara, formerly Yathrib, was a Jewish city. And the Jews are the ones who lived there. No Arabs, it was Jewish. And the Jews themselves, they had made migration after the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem. They had destroyed the second destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. So they make migration south. And they established the city of what? Of Yathrib. So the Ansar, in one sense, they're migrants. And that's important for them. They come to a city that's already inhabited. So they know a jazat al-ihsan and al-ihsan. If people and accept the doors in this city, then when others come to our city, likewise. You see, like for like, that's important for them. But also they're people of war. You see, so yani, Jews love power. You see, Arabs want a bit of power as well. Not the best of mixes. So they go to war against each other, the Jews and the Aus and the Khazrat. Periodically they go to war against each other. And every time, khalas, the, the, the Ansar, the Aus and Khazrat defeat the Jews. Every time they vanquish them, put them in their places. And then the Jews tell them something that sticks in the psyche of the Ansar. One day it's going to be very different in war. Why? Because at the end of time, God will send his prophet. You are idolaters. 
were manifests, and the prophet at the end of time is a manifest, and he will give us victory on the battlefield. Uh, tells that to the Ansar, Aus and Khazrat, it etches in their mind, the prophet at the end of time, prophet at the end of time, prophet at the end of time, Arabs are people of war, will give them victory, prophet are not defeated. Uh, so when the prophet starts that manifest, they're the first to believe. They beat the Jews to it. This is the one the Jews have been speaking about. Khalas. They're the first to believe. Uh, and look, it turns the opposite direction on the basis of that. What the Jews decided was not what actually turned out. So the helpers, these are the Ansar, the Aus and the Khazraj. Although as we said, eventually they go to war against themselves, the two tribes, until the last battle, which is called the Bu'ad, is to the point of genocide. And that's the oath they make each side. So we're going to exterminate the entire, the other, the other, the enemy. Aus are going to exterminate Khazraj. Khazraj are going to exterminate the Aus. Okay, and that's when the, basically the entire leadership of both tribes are going to be wiped out in battle. Daya mentioned inside of the Quran, as we'll see. Hypocrites, they're the ones who survived it, the Shaykh and the Jews of Medina. Yeah, the likes of Qaynuqar, the likes of Banu Nadir, various tribes of the Jews, okay, okay, that are going to be um, problematic. Qurayba, uh, Qaynuqar, Nadir. These are like powerful tribes. That are traditional inhabitants of Bidito Munawara, and to them it's problematic the manifestation of prophecy. A recognition of who he is, but there's the difficulty to be able to submit to prophecy. And it's going to be problematic for them, as we will see, inshallah ta'ala. So here the emigrants, Allah ta'ala, we look at a few verses that we'll, inshallah ta'ala, finish. Whoever flees for the sake of God will find many a refuge on earth and plentitude, and anyone who leaves his home taking refuge in God and the messenger of God, and then death overtakes him. His reward is up to God, and God is most forgiving, most merciful. So this was something Allah Ta'ala imposed, imposed upon the actual what believers, that they had to migrate, with an imposition. And not only did they have to migrate, but that their intention had to be pure. That's the tradition in the Bukhari Muslim, Umar ibn Khattab. In Makana hijratu ilallahi wa rasoola, hijratu ilallahi wa rasoola. Wa makana hijratu li dunya yusiba wa mara'atin yam kihuba. Wa marahut fa hijratu ilama hajara ilay. Whoever migrates, Two, i.e. for Allah and His Messenger, migrate to Allah and His Messenger for dunya and akhirah. But whoever migrates for the world in order to attain it, or for a woman in order to marry her, then the Prophet said, then they migrate unto that which they migrated. Right? They want, they get that which they migrated for. Right? They get a bit of dunya and they maybe get a woman to marry. Okay, I'd say to people did, a woman in Medina to Munawara, she told one of the men from Mecca, Sahaba, that what if you want to migrate, uh, you want to marry me? You got to come and live in my city. I ain't moving to no Mecca. You got to come and live in Medina. And her name was Um Qais. So he then migrates, same time he migrates, but to marry Um Qais. And the Sahaba used to make fun of him. They called him Muhajir Um Qais. You migrated for a woman, for Um Qais. We migrated for Allah as a Rasul. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And they're not too different to our days. Eh? Uh, you know, we, have, we have economic migrants. And we have those who migrate for marriage. Same thing, isn't it? That's dunya yusibu hai mra'atin yankihuha. But movement upon the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be for Allah and His Rasul. That's the nature of how we move upon the earth of Allah ta'ala. Siru fil ardi. Fandul kayfa bada al khalq. Tayyib. So these are, the, these are the emigrants, the people of Mecca. And the people of the highest level of what? Of, of religious um, endeavor. Help us, as we said, the Ansar, the verses, and hold fast to the rope of God, everyone, and do not become divided. And remember God's blessing upon you when you were enemies, aus against Khazraj. And He, i.e., Allah, united your heart so you became brethren by the blessing of God. Allah Ta'ala says, uh, and the Tustari Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said, the blessing here is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's Ni'matullah al Kubra. And you were on the brink of a pit of fire, and he rescued you from it. Thus does God manifest signs of the divine to you that you may be guided. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, and these are the Ansar. And it was a delicate balance for a while with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And any smallest thing, the Ansar were on the verge of what? Of resurrecting old what enmities. Like on the verge of civil war in Medina. We see it several times on the verge of. 
But it's the Prophet وسلم, each and every single time is there to actually what? Crush the issue until it's eventually crushed from their hearts. And they became ikhwana fi'lan. Brothers, in the real sense, inwardly and outwardly, and they're known as the Ansar, the helpers of the Prophet ﷺ. When a book from God has come to them confirming the truth of what they have, and they have earlier been seeking divine assistance against those who scoffed, when they came to them, that is something they recognized, they repudiated it, and the case of God is upon the disbelievers. And who is this verse about? It's about the Jews of Medina. Okay, but it also involves the Ansar and love themselves. I when a book from God, I the Quran has come to them, confirming the truth of what they have, confirming the Torah. And they have earlier been seeking divine assistance against those who scoff, those who disbelieve, threatening the Ansar. One day the Prophet in end time will come and he's a monotheist and he will give us victory. Every time they were defeated in war. And they knew of the Prophet, they recognized the Prophet. They found him inside of the book. Allah Ta'ala says they knew him, recognized him in the same way they recognized their own children. And, and literally, and in the first one, as we mentioned in our last session, to recognize the Prophet is a Jew. And like, how did he know what the Prophet looked like? The Jew recognized the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The rest of them, they're jumping on Abu Bakr. And he's, oh, that's the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They knew in facial description, like Abdullah ibn Salam, the great rabbi, I saw every sign of prophecy in his face. Abdullah ibn Salam, and this is not the face of a liar. Zayn bin Sa'an and Tabarani, I saw every face of war, every virtue, every sign of prophecy in his face alone, sallallahu alayhi wa Intricate knowledge. Sophia bin Tukuyay, the wife, our blessed mother, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi And one night she overhears voices inside of the house. So she goes and she listens, and she it's her father and her uncle and her husband discussing. Who are they discussing? The Prophet ﷺ. And she hears them say, Ahu, ahu, is it him? Is this him? Is this the Prophet in the Torah? And then she hears, Ahu, ahu, it's him. That is him. Uh, she overhears it with her own ears. Her father, a Jew, her husband, a Jew, and her what? And her uncle, her father's brother, all recognize and this is the prophet at the end of time. And from that moment, faith enters into her heart. I mean, she's innocent. Uh, she has a dream. Sayyidina Sophia, Sophia ta'ala anha, in the dream in the Sahih, she has a dream. And in this dream, she's sitting and the full moon boom, drops into her lap. Just drops into her lap, saying to Sophia radiallahu uh, ta'ala anha. So what? She's innocent. And she wakes up, what a powerful dream that was. So she tells her husband, I had a dream and the full moon has dropped into my lap. And her husband slaps her in the face. He understood the dream. <laughs> that the full moon was the messenger of Allah, sallallahu wa sallam. He understood the dream, slaps it into Sophia in the face. But look at the interpretation, the knowledge of who the Prophet, sallallahu wa sallam. So they knew who he was. So when they came to them, that is... Something they recognized, i.e. the Prophet they repudiated it, rejected the messenger. Uh, that's why Allah Ta'ala says, يَعْرِفُونَ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُنْكِرُونَهَا They recognized the blessing of Allah, the Prophet ثُمَّ يُنْكِرُونَهَا Then they deny him. Mm, no, 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 no. That's one of the problems. And that's why Allah Ta'ala says, and the case of God is upon the disbelievers, rejectors. Those who reject after recognition of the reality. <coughs> the hypocrites. Allah Ta'ala has an entire surah about the hypocrites. Okay, an entire surah. Th though their appearances please you, when you see them and you listen to their words when they speak, it is as if they are propped up timbers. And khushubun musannada. They think... Every outcry is against them. They are the enemy, so beware of them. God will fight them. How are they deceived? How are they deceived? These are the hypocrites, and we will learn, inshallah ta'ala, something about their reality. Because they are one of the three realities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to craft all human beings. Rubrics. Either your believers, as we see in Surah Al Baqarah, your believers, or your disbelievers. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have much to say about either. If 
two verses, three, I think three verses, or a few verses about the believers, even less about the disbelievers, but then a lot about the people of hypocrisy. That's the scheme in Surah Al-Baqarah, very beginning of Baqarah, delineates all types of human beings. We all fall under one of three categories. Likewise, we also see in Surah Al-Tawbah, the great chapter, Surah Al-Tawbah, which is what? It's exposing the scandalous <laughs> nature of the hypocrites and of themselves. Okay? Allah Ta'ala likewise speaks about all three. That when we look up at the titles of the ninth Surah of the Quran, the only Surah without Bismillah, Rahman, and Rahim, it has three different names. First name, it's Surah Al-Tawbah, the chapter of repentance. Okay? Second name, it's Surah Al-Bara'a, the chapter of innocence declared. Third name, Surah al fadiha the chapter of the, the, of, of the scandal, of the exposition, people being exposed. Tawbah, that's for believers. Bara'a, that's for disbelievers. Fadiha, that's for hypocrites. Three revealed titles for that surah, ninth surah, inside of the Quran. So everybody is one of three. These are the hypocrites, unfortunate beings. And the Prophet knew every single one. Now, every single one, he knew every single one of them. Which is again, it's the heart. Hypocrisy is inside of the heart. It doesn't manifest upon the limbs here. It's that you, in your heart, you deny on your limbs, you feign practice. And you, every single one, one of the knights in Medina, Prophet is walking in Medina, and it's torrential rain, and the, all of them have gathered for council and assembly. And as the Prophet passes by, <coughs> light and strikes, say cheese. And they all look at them, see, boom, 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 every single face. And then he goes and tells Sayyidina Hudayf ibn Yaman, everyone, Fulan, 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 Fulan. That's so why Hudayf is called the bearer of the prophetic secret. He knew every single one of them, but despite that, look how he behaved with them. Amazing. He gave them the utmost quote unquote respect, treated them in the best of ways, despite the fact he knew their reality, that they were liars, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us. We'll speak about them, and the last, when we finish, are the Jews. Okay, and Allah Ta'ala says, and we decreed in the scripture for the Israelites, you will sow corruption on earth twice, and you will become inflated with arrogance. Now when the first prediction of the two came about, we sent servants of ours capable of violent force, and they searched through the homes, and so one prediction was fulfilled, and the yet second remains to be fulfilled. Okay. It's nature of Banu Israel, inshallah ta'ala. Now next session we'll begin to look at the, the, the predominant themes of war, of actually Medina to Munawara, two themes, war and law, war and law, that's Medina. It's about law, legislation, legal aspect of the religion, and it's also about defense in the, of the religion. Okay, war, jihad. Okay, inshallah ta'ala, anyone have any questions? We're going to finish there, inshallah ta'ala, any questions? Um, yeah, um, I'm... Well, first of all, you know, I thank you very much regarding, you know, uh, discourse narrative, you know, you... What is that? Eh? And I extend thanks to yourself as okay. well. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, I'm saying um, regarding, well, the historical facts, you know, well, you know, delineated and well, you know, articulated by yourself, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how would you, for instance, um, explain to us, obviously, you know, there is a, a historical precedent to what, you know, you exa exactly you know, um, pan out very clearly. But with the events, you know, of what we are seeing so far, you know, wherever I found wisdom, obviously I want to tease out from you, someone who is very well past. Um, can you shed light on what the events going on presently, you know, in the Arab world and Japan? And what is your take on this? What out of wisdom? Can you shed light on this, please? I mean, interesting times we live in. So, and that's a curse. That's what the Chinese say, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and interesting times are the case, generally. And Allah Ta'ala Alam, yani, first and foremost, yani, yani, the wisdom is the property of the wise ones, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think one of the things that we should draw from these events, first and foremost, is that wisdom and knowledge of the events and the purpose of events and that, those things that underpin events, that they're all the property of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's a tradition, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sayyidina Hudayb ibn al-Yaman, Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, have instructed us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yani, that he spoke about every single event that would occur. Every event that has occurred from the beginning of time up until the people of paradise enter paradise, and the people of hell enter hell. 
And say the Hudayf al he says, those that remember, remember, and those that forget, forget. And then he says, I too forgot. He said, except that it's like somebody who travels, you know him, and you forget about him. But when he returns back to you, oh, Fulan, now you think about him. He said, the same way with events. I forgot about events the Messenger spoke about, but then when they happen, subhanAllah, sadaqa rasul. The Prophet had mentioned them in detail, intricate detail. And the point I'm stressing about this is that first and foremost, these times require two things. First is a reattachment to Allah, a recommitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His worship, recognition of Him, and likewise a recommitment to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And it's, it's a rujur, okay, it's returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrates His power, and that's Japan. It's the divine power demonstrated. That's what we're seeing. Don't interpret it as anything else. Okay? It's all for rujoo in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fawqikum aw min tahta arjulikum wa yudhiku ba'dukum ba'tsa ba'd Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And it comes from above you. It comes from beneath you. Or he will make some of you taste the power, the might of others. The conflict in the Middle East. And the purpose is rujoo ilayhi subhanahu wa ta'ala. To turn back to he subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't interpret it as anything else. This is about something within has gone wrong. Do you understand? It's not something's gone wrong in Japan. That's not the khitab of people of Allah Ta'ala. Not something's gone wrong in Libya or gone wrong in Tunisia or gone wrong in Egypt. Something's gone wrong inside of us. Inside of us. The message is clear from Allah Ta'ala to each and every single one of us. We have to return back to Him. Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. And the return back to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, must be through the gateway of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa must be. That, that sort of the wisdom. I, our age, it tends towards order and chaos, and it, but in a radical, radical way, and it's very interesting times. Chaos manifests in the form of the edifice of the Antichrist. Uh, order manifests in the, in, in the form of Medhaj and Nabuwa, as the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi instructed us in traditions. Okay? And were we to delve into prophecy, the Prophet said that the Prophet mentioned the primary causes of tribulations by their name, by their father's name and their tribe. And it, it, it's detailed, we can bring you traditions of Hitler mentioned by name on the tongue of the Prophet And it ain't no joke when prophecy speaks. And the Prophet is speaking haq, la yakhruj min hadha illa al-haq. And the point I'm making, we would do best to attach to the voice of prophecy than the voice of America. You know, VOA, the news, the media, holy wood. We'd be better to attach to what does prophet tell, prophecy tell us about our situation rather than turning towards any disfigured means of information, which generally where we're at, muskila, it's a problem. That's how we interpret the time, nothing else. Anyway. But at the same time, we pray for safety and security. We pray for safety and security for the people of Japan. And the good folk, good people there. Okay? We pray that Allah Ta'ala keeps them secure. And that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, of those who are, who were sent beneath the waves, or those who were buried beneath the earth, that we pray that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala looks upon them favorably, and by and large, vast majority of them. And if we didn't go there with the light of Islam to guide them, we didn't convey religion to them. And the irony of it, and those types, Raised, go to paradise. No hujjan alayhim. When Sayyidina Aisha asked about those who were what? They're going to be brought beneath earthquakes, sent into the midst of the earth, the belly of the earth. How is this? What's the wisdom behind it? Hassan says, Human beings are raised upon their intentions. Don't look at what happens inside of the world. Try to gaze at what will take place in the world to come. Okay, that's how we deal with yani, manifestations of divine might and power. Okay? That's what we're seeing. And we ask Allah Ta'ala for safety. And now we hear China's rumbling. Huh? Prophet spoke about in Sahih Muslim and others about what? Now earthquakes will become frequent. It's a reality. Look how we're seeing it. Wasn't it last month Australia? Now it's Japan. Now we're here in China. Well, you think it's not going to be here? You think that these type of events can't afflict us? If you'd spoke to people in Japan a day before the tsunami hit, cave. I mean, look at people when it hit, 
Look at, look at the news coverage, any hits, what were people doing right there on the brink of the tsunami. And I had a report that this was the, the, the top center in the world for, war, for detecting tsunamis. And the reporter asked, when a tsunami is about to hit, and when do you know it's about to hit? And he says, "Am am." He's beating around the bush. It's a simple question. Don't beat around the bush. How long do you know before the hit? He says, mm, five or ten minutes. But then we've got to tell people. Five. You, this is the, the supreme control center of you know, detecting earthquakes and tsunamis, and it's, the best you've got is five or ten minutes before. And then you've still got to disseminate the knowledge that it's about to hit. The point I'm trying to stress here is when we detach from original order, had you only just gazed at the animals, mm -hmm. looked at animals being still connected with the earth, with real creatures, you would have got like hours of notice about what was about to hit inside the natural order. Just the movement of animals would have told you something has gone wrong. And we better move in the direction of the animals, follow them. You see, like what have they did to be sent beneath the earth? No. They generally escape these tribulations. Generally escape them. Human beings interference in the earth in Surah Al-Rum, Bahar al-Fasad fil barri wal Bahar, Imam Kasabat Aidin Nas. Corruption appears upon land and sea due to what man's hands are in. Why, Ya Allah, why? Liyuviqahum ba'd Allah the Amin. So we make them taste some of what their hands are made. And perhaps they may return back to Isa subhanahu wa ta'ala. What our hands are made, what, what the animals did. So they generally escape. Look at the book called Waste, the book called Waste. Read the book where he says the greed of England, who like shrimps and prawns and all of that stuff, because they overfished in Indonesia and they took a natural barrier against the tsunami so it wouldn't hit land. They took that many fish and prawns from the seas of Indonesia, it removed a natural barrier that Allah Ta'ala placed there. And when the tsunami hit, it hit with devastating force because of what man's hands are there directly, empirically understood. And we've got to understand our inter interference in the mizan, in the balance upon the face of the earth. And if we can't look at Kafar of Hajara. We've got to look at Ahl al the people of Islam, the stewards, Ahl al Khilafah. Yani, at this point, that's the point, we're all blaggers, we're all fraudsters, all of us. And if we're going to sit and just chat nonsense around a cup of tea and a few chocolate biscuits, what do you think about the tsunami? What do you think is happening in Japan? What's the wisdom of that? Usjud faqtarib! Bow your head and draw close to Allah Ta'ala and plead for forgiveness. Yani, that's the issue, yani. It's not chatting nonsense, not discussing it over CNN or what have you. And it get real. And would, would that would have been the message of the Sahaba? And it, what would the message of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa would he be chatting nonsense about what, about what goes on in the world? We don't hear him. His conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His pleading is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand the type of people are crafted? Earthquakes happen in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He takes his staff, boom, stamps it upon the earth, be still. And the earth is still. Time of Amr ibn al-Khattab, earthquake shake, boom, be still. And it's still. The Nile begins to do its own thing. Look at Umar. Umar's crazy. Ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala, he writes a letter to the Nile from Umar ibn al-Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, to the Nile of Egypt. <laughs> and he sends it to Amr ibn al-As. Give the letter to the Nile. If you rise and fall of your own accord and do what you like, but if you're beneath the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you better listen soon. Huh? And the Nile listens to Umar, the letter of Umar. That's, a, that's someone who's crazy. Someone who's yani, khalas, like Hassan al-Basri said, Majaneen. They were mad people, these people, these folk, these sahaba. In different types of way they operate inside of the universe. Really radically different. And what's water? Something that's controlled by Allah ta'ala. Tsunami comes, Sahaba, who place his hand in front of the tsunami, keep it in check. Prophet does it for the, the fire, the most uncontrollable creation of Allah Ta'ala, Yawm al Qiyamah, places his hand in front of hellfire, mm. hellfire is still in check, and the angels can recapture hell, 14 million of them. <laughs> Kaif. Abu Al Hadrami, he gets to water, 
Abu Huraira, Sahaba, armies, there they are in the Persian Gulf. Hmm, what do we do here? Hold on. Jumps off his horse, Rakatain. Look, Rakatain on his horse, right, hit the water. <laughs> Over the water, Abu Huraira says, and we were having a conversation. It's the hooves of our horses never even got wet, and we could all conversation with each other as we're riding across the Gulf. Medjanin, crazy folk, crazy people. Those who place power in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala manifests power, his power, upon their hands and everything is subjugated beneath them. They're the true stewards of the air. And that's what our time demands. That's what our time summons for. Doesn't, it doesn't need jokers. Jokers end up in the army of the Dajjal. Uh, it needs those who will say this about Menhaj and Nabuwa. So they stand in the armies of great people, Isa ibn Maryam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Mahdi al Muntadir. That's what it needs in our time. Serious folk, and serious folk are crazy. That's what serious folk, they're crazy. They cast the dunya beside them, behind them, just like the day palm tree, and they yearn for Mustafa. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Any questions? بزاخ الله خير صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم